The balance of writer and readers has changed. Today, it is a sad fact of life that the number of American readers is in decline while the number of writers violently explodes with self-published books. <laughs> in the bad old days, it was difficult to get a book published. It was both essential and hard to get an agent. Writers who sent their manuscripts directly to publishers knew they would go into the infamous slush pile from which the snooty publishing house editors rejected most and chose very few. This filtration system was accepted as a kind of meritocracy, but now it looks more elitist than democratic. Recently, just as Amazon began grazing on the publisher's overgrazed turf, rejected or wishful book writers connected with tax-savvy facilitators. The orphan child of publishing, the vanity press or self-publishing, suddenly turned red hot. Bowker's count of self-published books, once the desperate last resort of the passionate crank, last year, was 391,000 self-published titles. Why are all these people writing? And who, who is reading the books? Aye, there's the rub. The terrible truth slowly dawns that, yes, Uncle Brewster has written a book about his years as an attendant at a service station plagued by vampires, but no one buys it and it is lost in the tsunami of self-published books. Enter the dark world of reviews and more inventive ingenuity. One of the occupations tied to the book industry was that of reviewer, a job for which the only qualification was being able to read. <laughs> there used to be two kinds of reviewers. One was a person who paid for his or her, re who was paid for his or her reviews by a newspaper or a magazine making a nod to culture. This wretch was well described in George Orwell's essay, Confessions of a Book Reviewer, as working at, quote, a quite exceptionally thankless, irritating, and exhausting job, a description echoed in a burned out farewell essay a year or two ago by the Washington Post's longtime reviewer, Michael Deirdre. Orwell said that the reviewer, pressed for time and money, went from muttering, God, what tripe, to cooing the rubbishy cliches, not to be missed, and a welcome addition to the pipefitter's bookshelf, and so forth. <laughs> the second type of reviewer, usually enlisted by the author's publisher, was a fellow writer, unpaid, and something of a pimp, one who indeed <laughs> may have felt the book was tripe, but who wrote dulcet words of praise, usually stuck on the jacket as a blurb, because sooner or later, he or she would also need a verbal bouquet, a quid pro quo. 